What's up, guys? I hope this podcast finds you all doing very well. With the recent Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather fight happening over the weekend, I thought now would be an appropriate time to talk about boxers' fractures. So quickly, before we do, let's go over some anatomy of the hand. The hand is made up of 27 bones. You have your phalanges, metacarpals, and carpal bones. Your phalanges are comprised by 14 bones and are further broken down into distal, middle, and proximal phalanges except for the thumb, which only has a distal and proximal phalanges. From there, you have your five metacarpals. Both the metacarpals and the phalanges can be described by numbers one through five. The first metacarpal refers to the thumb, the second index finger, third middle finger, fourth ring finger, and fifth pinky finger. And then you have your eight carpal bones. So now we know the basic anatomy of the hand, but what is a boxer's fracture? A boxer's fracture is a fracture of the fourth or fifth metacarpal neck. I'll say that again. A boxer's fracture is a fracture through the fourth or fifth metacarpal neck. They most commonly occur from direct trauma to a clenched fist. However, experienced boxers rarely sustain this type of injury. This is because professional boxers do not typically punch in a roundhouse motion, whereas most of our amateur street fighters do. So let's give a visual example. If you clench your fist and then just throw a straight jab, as most boxers do, when you get to full elbow extension, you can see that all your knuckles line up. So when they make contact with an object, the force of that object is dispersed equally across all of their knuckles. However, when you clench your fist and you punch in a roundhouse motion, your fourth and fifth metacarpals make contact first. So they're having to absorb a tremendous amount of energy instead of all that energy being dispersed across all four metacarpals. So now let's talk about how to work up these patients. Before you enter the room, make sure to take a look at the triage note and review the patient's vital signs. The triage note might say something like, the patient got angry and punched a wall. Well, before even entering the room, you should be thinking about a boxer's fracture and your differential diagnosis. However, surprisingly enough, a lot of my patients tell me they punched a tree. Maybe that's just because I work in a more rural area, but who knows. Once you enter the room, start off by taking a good history. Ask them when their symptoms started. Ask them about any alleviating or aggravating features. If they're in pain, have them describe the pain. Does the pain radiate or travel to another area of the body? Also ask them about the severity of their pain, so later on you can adequately assess if you're managing it properly. And finally, ask them about any associated symptoms, such as numbness, tingling, loss of motor function, and swelling. To be thorough, ask them about the past medical history, past surgical history, and allergies to medications. Next, let's go into the physical exam. These patients will often present with swelling to the dorsum of the hand with bony tenderness to palpation over the fractured metacarpal on the dorsal side. Now, if they have significant tenderness to palpation or bruising on the baller surface, more commonly referred to as the palmer surface, This is highly suggestive of a fracture. You might also see loss of prominence of the knuckle. And next, you want to assess for any rotational deformities. You can do this by making a semi-clenched fist, and the normal alignment will show the digits all pointing to the regions of the scaphoid bone. So it might look something like this. A rotational deformity would be if you ask the patient to do this, and the fifth finger overlapped the fourth. You will want to compare the injured hand next to the opposite hand to help identify any subtle differences between the two. Make sure to evaluate the extensor apparatus of the fingers. You can do this simply by having the patient extend their finger. If the fracture is severely angulated, when they try to do this, they will have hyperextension at the MCP with flexion at the PIP. So hyperextension at the MCP with flexion at the PIP. This is called a pseudo-claw deformity because it actually looks like a claw. It'll look something like this. In addition, take a look at the integrity of the skin to make sure there are no breaks in the skin that could indicate an open fracture. Also, pay close attention to the knuckles because this area is extremely prone to fight bites. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you punch someone in the face and their tooth punctures through your skin overlying your knuckle. Now you have a fight bite and all that nasty bacteria from their mouth can cause significant infections. In these patients, you want to give a dose of amoxicillin clavulonic acid, also known as Augmentin, in the ER. 
irrigate their wound with copious amounts of normal saline, and cleanse their wound with betadine. You'll also want to send them home with a prescription of Augmentin as well. Check for capillary refill, sensation, and make sure they don't have any concomitant wrist injuries. So what radiographic studies do we need to order? Well, you're going to want to get a three-view x-ray of the hand so that you can see AP, lateral, and oblique images. Once you identify the fracture, you need to measure the angulation. Angulation should be measured on the lateral view. You can do this by using the shaft of the metacarpal and drawing a line through the midpoint of the fracture fragment. Angulation in these types of fractures is almost universally apex dorsal due to the pull of the interosseous muscles with the distal metacarpal head with palmar angulation. Historically, acceptable degrees of angulation can be remembered by the 10, 20, 30, 40 degree rule, with the second metacarpal neck able to tolerate about 10 degrees of angulation, the third metacarpal 20 degrees of angulation, the fourth 30 degrees of angulation, and the fifth tolerating 40 degrees of angulation. However, studies are now showing that any metacarpal fracture with more than 30 degrees of fracture angulation will impair motor function down the line. So I think it's reasonable to update the old rule to 10, 20, 30, 30. So how do we treat these patients? Well, if you do not have an unacceptable degrees of angulation, simply immobilize the patient in an ulnar gutter splint and have them follow up with orthopedics. However, if you have a patient with an unacceptable degree of angulation or they have some pseudo clawing, you'll need to do an acute reduction in the ED. Effective anesthesia can be achieved with a hematoma block. This can be done simply by cleaning the skin first with betadine or chlorhexidine. Then, with a 12cc syringe and 23 gauge needle, inject about 5 to 7 cc's of 1% lidocaine without epi or 0.5% marcaine without epi directly into the fracture hematoma on the dorsal side. You will know you are within the hematoma when you aspirate blood into the syringe. You will want to inject about 3 to 4 cc's of lidocaine then aspirate 3 to 4 cc's of blood and lidocaine mixture that was just injected without removing the needle. The logic here is you don't want to significantly increase the volume of fluid within the hematoma, so you should take off a mixture of 4 cc's of blood and lidocaine. However, I think a reasonable approach to this is to inject 4 cc's into the hematoma initially, aspirate some blood, and then inject a couple more cc's of lidocaine and blood mixture. I also see many providers ever aspirating any blood, but there's more than one way to cook an egg. After you have successfully anesthetized, wait about a minute for the lidocaine to take effect. But even before doing this procedure, you might want to provide the patient with additional analgesia or anoxiolytic medications such as morphine or Ativan. Reduction can be done by the 90-90-90 method. Have the patient flex his MCP, PIP, and DIP joints all to 90 degrees. So if you did this with all fingers, it would look like you're making a fist. Then apply axial pressure to the flex PIP joint while at the same time applying a downward pressure over the fracture site. Once you feel like you have an adequate reduction, immobilize with an ulnar gutter splint and take post-reduction films to make sure you have proper reduction and alignment. Indications for immediate surgical consultation are needed in some cases. If you have an open metacarpal neck fracture, for example, there's a laceration and it's extending into your bone, if you have any major neurovascular impairment or fractures with any rotational component, especially if they're a patient and their job requires a lot of fine motor skills, such as a musician or a seamstress, you really want to call your hand surgeon and get them involved early. And finally, how do we disposition these patients? Make sure to tell all patients about compartment syndrome and the signs and symptoms to look out for. Also be sure to document in your chart that you have given compartment syndrome education. Tell the patient to ice, elevate, and provide adequate pain medicine. I typically prescribe Norco 5325, which is a combination of hydrocodone and acetaminophen for most of my fractures. But you may have to prescribe something stronger depending on your patient's pain tolerance. So that's everything you need to know about boxer's fractures. Quickly, let's go over the main points rapid fire. A boxer's fracture is a fracture of the fourth or fifth metacarpal neck. 
They most commonly occur from direct trauma to a clenched fist. Before you enter the room, take a look at the triage note and review the patient's vital signs. Once you enter the room, start off by taking a good history. On physical exam, these patients will often present with swelling to the dorsum of the hand with bony tenderness to palpation over the fractured metacarpal on the dorsal side. If they have significant tenderness to palpation or bruising on the palmar surface, this is highly suggestive of a fracture. You might also see loss of prominence at the knuckle. Next, assess for any rotational deformities. You can do this by making a semi-clenched fist, and the normal alignment will show all the digits pointing to the region of the scaphoid bone. A rotational deformity would be seen if you ask the patient to do this and the fifth finger overlapped the fourth. You will want to compare the injured hand to the opposite hand to help identify any subtle differences between the two. Make sure to evaluate the extensor apparatus of the fingers as well. You can do this by simply having the patient extend their finger, and if the fracture is severely angulated, when they try to do this, they will have hyperextension at the MCP joint with flexion at the PIP joint. This is also called a pseudo-clawing deformity because it looks like a claw. In addition, take a look at the integrity of the skin to make sure there are no open fractures or fight bites. If your patient has a fight bite, give your first dose of amoxicillin clavulonic acid, also known as augmentin, in the ER. Irrigate their wound with copious amounts of normal saline, and cleanse their wound with betadine. You will also want to send them home with a prescription of this medication as well. Check for capillary refill, sensation, and make sure they don't have any concomitant wrist injuries. You should order a three-view x-ray of the hand so that you can see AP, lateral, and oblique images. Once you identify the fracture, you need to measure the angulation. Angulation should be measured on the lateral view. You can measure this by using the shaft of the metacarpal and drawing a line through the midpoint of the fracture fragment. Angulation in these types of fractures is almost universally apex dorsal due to the pull of the interosseous muscles with the distal metacarpal head with palmar angulation. Acceptable degrees of angulation can be remembered by the 10, 20, 30, 30 rule. With the second metacarpal neck able to tolerate 10, third, 20, fourth, 30, and fifth, 30. If you do not have unacceptable degrees of angulation, simply immobilize the patient in an ulnar gutter splint and have them follow up with orthopedics. However, if you have a patient with unacceptable degrees of angulation or pseudoclawing, you will need to do an acute reduction in the ED. Effective analgesia can be achieved by a hematoma block with or without morphine or benzodiazepines. Reduction can be done by the 90-90-90 method. Indications for immediate surgical consultation are needed for open metacarpal neck fractures, any major neurovascular impairment, or fractures with any rotational component especially if they're musicians or seamstress. And finally, make sure to tell all patients about compartment syndrome and the signs and symptoms to look out for. Also be sure to document in your chart that you have given compartment syndrome education. Tell the patient to ice, elevate, and prescribe adequate pain medicine. Well, I hope you guys found this useful. If you have any questions or comment, do not hesitate to email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.